Thank you. It's great to be with you this morning. You can be seated if you want to. Um, I'm not using the podium because I'm vertically challenged. Um, I look bigger up here than I actually am, but um, it is really, um, really great to be with you guys. I just, I travel a lot and speak in a lot of churches, and I just, I was just bawling this morning because you guys value the presence of God. And um, it grieves my heart that there's a lot of churches that that's just kind of fallen by the wayside, you know, and that's, that's why we're here. It's about Jesus. It's not about us. It's not about entertainment. It's not about all that. Um, I also know you value the presence of God because I asked pastor what time I'm supposed to finish. And he said, finish when you're done. And uh, <clears throat> so hopefully you won't be sad that he told me that this morning. But <laughs> anyway, I do hail from uh, West Lafayette. I am the director of Chi Alpha at Purdue University. I have some slides that go with it today. And uh, I've been there since 2007. I'm originally from the suburbs of Chicago, uh, born and raised there, went to the University of Illinois. And so I actually consider myself a foreign missionary to the land of Indiana. I uh, came here in 07 to pioneer uh, the campus ministry at Purdue University. Chi Alpha, if you don't know, is the Assemblies of God Outreach to the Secular University. And uh, we need a Chi Alpha here at Earlham College and IU East and Ivy Tech, man. Um, there were no Chi Alphas in 2007 when I came. Now there's 23 plus around the state. And we're believing that more, amen. We're believing that more will continue to grow and, and to be pioneered. Uh, God's just really been up to reviving uh, Chi Alpha. Thanks to our state director and area director and others that have been a part of that. But anyway, when we came in 07, there were no Chi Alphas. And I came to Purdue and we had a, a small group of students. And the Lord spoke to my heart and he said, Linda, you are to, I love this thing, make disciples. That's what God told us to do. He said, go to Purdue University. I want you to make disciples of all nations, not just white Americans, all nations. And he said, every nation, tongue, tribe, and language is around my throne. And, you know, Purdue is number three in the nation for international student enrollment. Our, our, the university is about 40,000. Richmond's about that, 36, 39,000. So it's about the size of, of the population of Richmond. And out of those 40,000 students, about 10,000 of them are from nations all around the world, about 120 plus different nations. So every, every four or five people on campus that you walk past, they're from some other country in the world. And they come here, they already know English, they're geniuses because they're studying in a second language, getting higher education. And they're curious about having friendships with Americans and American culture. It's super easy to get to know them. So the Lord spoke to my heart, and he said, you are to go to Purdue University, which is this warehouse for training up leaders that will transform the world, and people that will, trans internationals that will go back to their countries and be in high echelons of leadership, and to reach them with the gospel, and to make disciples of them. And so the Lord spoke to me, he said, you are to make, this is your goal, every student from every nation, a disciple maker for Jesus. And so that's our goal, that's how we train our students. So we came in 07, and you can see our group uh, was a bunch of white people. We actually have a couple Ukrainians. There, there was one standing in the back, but you can't tell he's from Ukraine, the big tall guy on the right-hand side. Uh, but that was it when we started, just a small group of students. But the Lord had put it in my heart. Lord, we're supposed to be so much more diverse than this, and we're supposed to be reaching more of our campus. And so God's been getting that heart, that DNA into our students over the last eight years. And so here's a picture of where we were just last fall at our fall retreat, where God has expanded the growth there. Praise the Lord. So we have a number of different internationals that are involved with us, and I want to tell you about one. Her name is Emily. In the next picture, Emily is getting a piggyback ride from Alexis. Uh, Alexis is one of our student leaders who met Emily at the beginning of this school year. Emily's from China. She was raised in a communist culture that says science explains everything, God doesn't exist. And Emily comes here, meets Alexis. They start hanging out. Alexis took her out for some Starbucks and said, hey, do you want to get to know each other? And eventually, it, just sharing life together, it comes out that Alexis follows Jesus. And Emily is like, what is that? So tell me more about that. Emily started coming to her small group, which we call missional communities at Purdue. And so it's a community of believers who make Jesus known as they live life together. And so Emily starts hanging out with them, playing co-rec sports and, and uh, going to movies and whatever. And over a period of time, Emily came to the point where she realized Jesus is not just a religion, he's real. You can experience him. He's a person. And so she committed her heart to follow Jesus. A week later, she got baptized in the Holy Spirit 
She's living radically for Jesus, getting discipled, praise the Lord, and we're believing God. We've been praying for more Chinese to be added to our number because it's, it's one thing for me to try to reach out to a Chinese person, but when a Chinese student who came from that culture who says, I know what it's like to not even believe there's a God, to even go to say there is a God, to say Jesus is the only way to the Father, I've, I've walked that path. So we're believing that Emily, she's a freshman. We got four more years or three and a half more years of Emily reaching out to the more than 4,000 Chinese students on our campus. So anyway, we're really excited about what Jesus is doing to help us reach some of the, the internationals there at Purdue. And if you'd like to learn more about uh, Purdue, uh, Chi Alpha, or maybe some of you guys are alumni from Purdue, or, oh, yes, and a love Boilermaker right there, Boiler Up, yes. Um, so maybe you have a particular interest and would like to pray for us, or if you know a student that might be headed, whether it's to Purdue University or some other university uh, across the U.S., we have Chi Alphas on over 300 different campuses. So. We'd love to get you connected. I do have a table in the back. You can fill out information about a student. Um, I also have e-newsletters that you can get an email once a month just to hear what we're doing with some bullet point points on how to pray. And I personally need your prayer because in addition, my, my primary role and my primary calling in life is to make disciples at Purdue University. And I, by God's grace, I, I want to remain there till he comes again and just keep making disciples. Uh, but on the side, God has opened up these doors uh, on the topic uh, today on homosexuality, and it's, it's much needed. And so uh, I need your intercession and your prayers. And so if you are an intercessor, I know not all of you would necessarily consider yourself an intercessor, but if you are, you know who you are. Um, and I really need your help. If you feel called to intercede, I have a special private email list only for intercessors of trusted people that get emails whenever I go out and speak like this. So we have about 200 people praying some very specific bullet points for today's uh, message and today's service. If you would like to join that army of intercessors, I, I really covet that because I don't want to be taken out of the fight. I know the enemy would like to do that. So if you would like to join that intercessor list, there's, you can just mark the box on the e-newsletter thing and just check intercessor, and you'll get those private emails to pray when I go different places to speak. So appreciate that. There's a table in the back for those things. But today, I'm going to share with you a message on compassion without compromise, a Christian response to homosexuality. I'm actually going to try to summarize about six hours of teaching and condense it. Um, this is based on my master's thesis, which I wrote uh, for the Assemblies of God Theological Seminary. It is available online for free to download on my website, which is just my name, lindaseiler.com. If you don't know how to spell my name, it's in the bulletin, S-E-I-L-E-R.com. And you can download that and read more details than I'm ever able to share during this period of time. Uh, but I am currently enrolled at AGTS, continuing in my PhD in this area to train and equip the church in this crucial hour. So that's what I'm going to be sharing with you guys this morning. But before we jump into it, let's ask Jesus to be the one that teaches us today. So, Lord, we just, I thank you that you're already here, that this church just values your presence. You love them and you love to be with them. And Lord, I pray over this uh, congregation, over my brothers and sisters, I pray for anybody struggling today with their own gender identity and sexuality, that you would give them hope and encouragement. I pray for any parents who might have a child that's struggling with this and they're, they're second-guessing themselves and really having a hard time. God, would you strengthen their hearts this morning? God, I pray for those that have coworkers and neighbors and family members that have embraced a gay identity and they don't know how to respond. Lord, would you equip your body this morning so that we can be the salt and the light that you've called us to be. God, I just pray that this that Lighthouse Assembly truly would be a lighthouse in this area regarding homosexuality, that they would be ones that shine their light, and you would raise up even men and women in this church that would be willing to be trained and equipped to help people get free from these kinds of sexual issues. God, I thank you that you want to bring your kingdom here and continue to expand it. We just ask you to do that this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, one of the reasons why I'm interested in this topic is not just because I wrote my master's thesis on this, but it's because from my earliest memory, I wanted to be a little boy instead of a little girl. And this wasn't a passing thought. This wasn't a phase. This was an obsession to have male genitalia. I knew I was not complete unless I was a male. And this was in the 1970s. I'm, I'm 42, so you don't have to do any math today. Uh, in the 1970s, when we, don't, we didn't talk about this, 
I didn't even know what the word transgender was. I had no clue. But I knew that there was something about this that was wrong and that I shouldn't tell my parents. I had never read a Bible verse about it. My parents had never told me, oh, you're the son we wish we never had and, you know, all of that. None of that came from the outside. This was something internal that I just knew I was not complete unless I was a little boy. And so I'm dealing with all these things behind closed doors, not knowing you know, what to say. To, to, I didn't tell anybody. My parents, as you can see in the second picture, my parents just thought I was a tomboy and that eventually I would maybe just grow out of this because there's a lot of little girls that want to climb trees and play football instead of play with Barbies. But it wasn't something that I grew out of and it wasn't something that I told my parents. I just knew there was something wrong about this and I shouldn't tell anybody. You can see in the next picture, I'm nine years old, and I heard about these things called sex change operations. And I thought, that's the answer to my dilemma. As soon as I'm old enough and I have enough money, I'm going to change my name to David, which ironically is what my parents would have named me if I were a boy, and I'm going to live happily ever after. So I, I understand the whole Bruce Caitlyn Jenner thing. I, I know for some people, they're like, I don't get that. I can't get into that world. I get it. I've lived it. And so this is my plan as a nine year old. I'm just going to wait till I'm old enough and I can just resolve all of these things. Well, when I get into junior high, you can see in the next picture, that's me in about sixth grade. And you can see that I, I was still androgynous, very manly. And around the same time that all the other girls around me were interested in makeup and doing their hair and getting boy crazy, I wanted nothing to do with that. In fact, I was suicidally depressed because my voice was not changing, and I was not becoming the man that I knew I was on the inside. I was absolutely miserable. And yet, at the same time, to my horror, I also discovered that I was exclusively attracted to women. I didn't choose that. I didn't want that. But I felt helpless to change it. And I also, in the 1980s, we did not talk about these things. I had no one else to share this with. My parents had no idea. This was just a secret I was going to keep to myself. And so I, here I am in anguish and agony, wondering, what, what, what is going on and why am I not normal? Why do I not fit in? I had no friends. I knew I wasn't a girl, but I knew I technically wasn't a boy, and I just was like this third gender that didn't fit in. And I hated myself. Nobody wants to be friends with somebody who hates themselves. I was absolutely miserable and wanted to end my life. And so while I'm going through this, I'm thinking, wait a minute, if I am really a man trapped inside of a female body, then it would make sense that I'm attracted to other women. So technically, that makes me a straight man. So somehow in my sixth grade mind, it kind of made things make sense. So I thought, all right, I just need to hold out until I get enough money and I'm old enough and I can have the sex change and live happily ever after. So I get into uh, late junior high and I start thinking through the ramifications. You can see in the next picture, I'm about eighth grade there. And I'm thinking through, wait a minute, you can't just leave the house one day as Linda and come back the next day as David, and they don't know. Like, they're going to know. At some point, you're going to have to tell them. And then I started thinking of the whole coming out process, like, what, what will happen? Will my family accept me? I have no friends. All I've got is my family. Will they still love me when I tell them the monster that I really am? And I thought, you know what? I really have two options. Either I can have the sex change, uh, change my name to David, uh, and, and just run away and never tell my family and live happily ever after. And they'll just never know what happened to their daughter, and, but I can have my dream and get what I want. Or the other option is to not have the sex change and still keep my family. I chose option B. Because of all the things I had on the earth, I thought at least my family loves me and I love them, so I'd like to keep my family. So I made a conscious decision in late junior high. These are the cards you've been given. This means you're going to be consigned to a life of suicidal depression, despair, loneliness. You're going to hate yourself. I'll probably end up killing myself anyway. But like these are just, this is just the deck of hands you've, you've been given in life. Well, at that point, I realized I better do something externally to try to look a little bit more like a girl to fool people so that nobody ever knows my secret. And so as I get into high school, you can see I made some efforts in the next picture to grow out my hair a little bit. I did have a mullet for a season of time, which was a very bad idea. Uh, yeah, all the 80s people are like, yeah, mullets. There's actually a website, uh, friendsdon'tletfriendsgetmullets.com. <laughs> Unfortunately, the internet did not exist at that time, so I was not spared. But it was a very popular hairdo for male soccer players at the time. 
But at any rate, I, I have an older sister, so I thought, I'm going to try to grow my hair out, and uh, maybe, you know, maybe I don't like boys because I've never tried to be with a boy. Maybe I should try to experiment sexually with boys, and it might, like, awaken something in me that's dormant, right? So uh, here I am my junior year in high school, and the next picture, I borrowed one of my sister's dresses, and here I am standing much like a football player next to this guy from my physics class that I invited to the turnabout dance. There were no sparks flying that night, and, uh, but this was the beginning of my attempts to experiment with boys and see if something would awaken. I actually ended up going to prom my junior and my senior year. I wore my sister's dress this, both years. Um, but when I was wearing those dresses, I still felt like a man dressed in drag. It, it just deep down, I knew this is not who I really am. And as much as I tried to experiment with boys, it didn't flip any switch and turn anything on. The only thing it did was intensify my jealousy. I want to be the guy with the girl, not the girl with the, with the guy. I just knew intuitively it is superior to be a man than it is to be a woman. A woman is a second-class citizen. She is inferior. So I'm going through life, you know, uh, struggling with these things. The same year, my junior year in high school, I go to an outreach in downtown Chicago, and I hear the gospel for the first time. Nobody had to tell me I was a sinner. I had been exposed to pornography when I was 10 years old, and I was steeped in sexual addictions, could not get free no matter how hard I tried. I knew it was wrong. I was condemned about it but I was just given over. And so I hear this altar call about receiving Jesus. I thought, that's it. That's what I need. So I receive Jesus, and I think, okay, I'm going to wake up the next morning, and all these things are going to go away. Because if anybody's in Christ, they're a new creation, right? The old is gone. The new has come. I wake up the next morning. I'm equally attracted to women and still want to be a man. But now I'm in a catch-22 because it's 1989, and nobody talks about transsexuality and homosexuality in the church. And by the way, the issues I was dealing with, not every person who is same-sex attracted also wants to be the opposite gender in their body. Transsexuality is different than homosexuality. So I had a double whammy. I had two things going on, and, but I couldn't talk to anybody about it. We don't talk about these things in the church. So now I thought, now I really need to try to fool people so nobody ever knows my secret. I really did meet Jesus when I heard the gospel. I really, my life began to change. I went to the University of Illinois. You can see in the next picture, this is my senior year in college at the University of Illinois with my Bible study. I'm actually madly attracted to the woman that's just straight above me. Her name was Nikki. She was our Bible study leader on staff with Crusade. And I just, I couldn't help it. I'm madly attracted to her, and, but I can't tell anybody. And I'm miserable because I'm living this double life. And I have these questions. Was I born this way? Is this something that could possibly change, or am I just stuck with this forever, but I'm dealing with this alone, all by myself? So what I'm sharing with you this morning is not coming out of a bunch of books that I read. It's not coming out of a story I heard from someone else. It's coming out of what I've lived in my life. And I want to cover just four questions with you this morning. The first one being, what does the Bible say about homosexuality? Secondly, what does science say? Are people born gay? Thirdly, is change or transformation even possible? And then lastly, what should be our response as the people of God in this crucial hour? So let's look at the first one. What does the Bible say? Well, in the Bible, homosexuality is explicitly mentioned seven different places. Four places in the Old Testament, three places in the New. I don't have time to exposit each one of those scriptures this morning. I'm just going to talk about one of them with you. But there is a great book if you would like to read. My master's thesis explains all these things in detail and offers. Here's what the Bible really says. Here's what revisionist pro-gay arguments are that try to twist those scriptures. Uh, my thesis goes through all of those. I borrowed heavily from Joe Gospel's book, The Gay Gospel, uh, as I was writing my thesis and then other resources and things out there. So his, his book does a great job uh, doing the same thing if you're interested in that book. It's, he offers some other things too, not just the scriptural part, but some other things uh, regarding science and, and stuff that I'm going to share this morning. But one, I'm just going to go through one scripture with you guys in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 9 through 11. This is what it says, do not be deceived. There's a lot of deception going on right now in our culture, isn't there? Tons of deception. And there are people who will say, oh, well, the Bible only mentions homosexuality seven times, so it must not be that important. And Jesus never explicitly mentioned it, so it must not be 
wrong. Okay, let me answer both of those things. First of all, just because the Bible doesn't mention it over and over doesn't mean that it's not important. What the Bible does mention is that God's normative design for, homo, for, for sexuality is one man with one woman in a covenant relationship for life. Any kind of sexuality outside of that is forbidden by God. Not just homosexuality. He's not, he's not picking on it as a pet sin. Fornication is wrong. I, I disciple college students. They sleep together with their boyfriends and girlfriends, and we're like, no, that's not okay, right? right? Pornography, right? That's, that's a total misuse of our sexuality. Sexual, sexual, it was, sex was meant to be relational. It's meant to be something that actually images God, which is a whole other teaching. I, I don't have time to get in this morning, but there's a, a book, not a book, there's a, a, a paper on my website called Homosexuality in the Context of Missio Dei, which means Mission of God. It's a free paper you can download under resources. And in that paper, I actually explain why homosexuality is wrong. Because that's what this generation is looking for. They don't want to rule, tell me what's right, what's wrong. I need to know why fundamentally. What's the theology of sexuality as to why this is wrong? So I work it all out based on the premise that God is a triune God. He's three persons, yet one God. So in God, he is unity in diversity. Now in our world, there's unity in sameness. But in, in the Bible, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. In the Hebrew, that actually reads, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our Elohim, which means gods, plural, is one, ichad, which means one in essence. That same word, ichad, is used in Genesis chapter 2, 24, where it says, husband and wife, the two will come together and become ichad. We reflect God in our differing genders in the fact that we have unity in diversity. A male and a female coming together have unity because they are both human beings, unity. But there's diversity because one is male and one is female. With homosexuality, you cannot image unity in diversity, which parallels the Trinity. Totally impossible. The same uh, concept happens even in the, the fact that Christ wants to become one with his bride, the church. That's the ultimate reality. Earthly marriage is just a shadow of a greater spiritual reality. And so Christ becoming one with the church also images unity in diversity. Because we are made in the image of God, we are like him, but we are not God. We are totally different and other than Jesus. And so he wants to become one with his bride, the church. So this concept of unity and diversity is at the root of our sexuality, and it's why gender actually matters in the plan of God. But I get it, having grown up as somebody who hated my gender. I didn't think there was anything good about being female at all. I thought they were second-class citizens. Who in their world would ever want to be a female? <laughs> Amen. I would too. I actually like being a female now. So anyway, there's a lot of deception going on in our culture. And so some people say, well, it's only listed seven places in the Bible. But that's because God's normative design for sexuality is, is listed, is there. It's, it's evident. If I were to give you a cookbook that's a, for diabetes, uh, people that are diabetics, and I were to say, here are some recipes that don't use sugar, I wouldn't need to use the word sugar in the recipe book over and over and over again. Just a couple times to say, we're avoiding sugar. And then the rest of the book is about how to avoid sugar, okay? Same thing in the Bible. I don't have to list it over and over and over and beat the dead horse. I say, this is the design for sexuality, and, and here are the ways that we don't practice it rightly, and here are the ways that do uh, image God in our sexuality. The other thing is people say, oh, well, Jesus didn't mention anything about sexuality, homosexuality. You know what? Jesus didn't say anything about rape, internet pornography, sex trafficking, there's a lot of things we deal with in our culture today he didn't say anything about. But what he did say is out of the heart come these evil thoughts. And he uses the word porneia, which means sexual immorality. And that is a word that his listeners would have understood to include everything outside of God's design for sex in marriage. Anything that includes adultery, when God says, thou shalt not commit adultery, that's including everything outside of God's normative design. And Jesus reaffirmed the Ten Commandments. Right? Some people say, oh, but the, you know, the Old Testament says don't eat pork and all of that stuff. You know what? The, there's, with the ceremonial law and the moral law in the Old Testament, the ceremonial law doesn't apply today, but the moral law does. It's still wrong to lie. It's still wrong to commit adultery. It's still wrong to covet. We still should honor our mother and our father. We're kind of losing that one today. We, it's still a command of God, right? 
It's repeated in the New Testament. Honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land the Lord God has. Your life may go well with you, Ephesians 6, 2 and 3, right? So this whole concept that um, homosexuality, you know, wasn't, uh, or, or the, with the moral law and the ceremonial law, the moral law still stands the test of time today. But the ceremonial law, the purpose it was given, was to set a mark on God's people and say, you are set apart, you are holy. So they practice, for example, circumcision to say, these are my people that are set apart. But in the New Testament, where the law is fulfilled, the ceremonial law is fulfilled, we no longer practice circumcision in the body. It's a, now it's a circumcision of the heart, right? And there are all sorts of food laws and things that were given as a symbol that these are people separate. But in the New Testament, now it's okay to eat any food. Praise the Lord. I love bacon and ham and all that stuff, right? It's good, right? It's shellfish, I eat it. It's good. I mean, you know. So anyway, those things are not forbidden. Jesus declared all foods clean. He didn't come to abolish the law. He fulfilled it in the sense that the ceremonial stuff, we don't need those anymore. Why? Because the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. He is the deposit, the mark, the seal guaranteeing our inheritance. And we should live in such a way that we are salt and light, and that is the mark. We should live a life that demands a gospel explanation. Because the mark of the Holy Spirit is so strong on us. So anyway, the, all that stuff about the Old Testament and, you know, those things, they don't stand under scrutiny. My master's thesis goes through each one of those scriptures and explains why. But anyway, back to 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9. Do you not know that wrongdoers will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who have sex with men, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. One of my favorite verses in the Bible. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Now I want you to notice, this scripture passage doesn't just list homosexuality. Again, homosexuality is not God's pet sin. God doesn't have a pet sin. He loves all of us. And he's grieved when we go after sin. Sin, sin is just a shortcut to try to get what... Our, our soul was designed to have met in God. It's a shortcut. So he lists a bunch of sins in this passage. And he says regarding all of these sins, such were some of you. Some of you were adulterers. Some of you were idolaters. Some of you were drunkards. Some of you were greedy. We could say that many of us in this room, I'm not going to take a show of hands and embarrass people, but you know what? Many of us could look at this list and say, I, I was one of those, right? But we were washed. We were transformed. The Holy Spirit came inside of us. You can be set free from homosexuality just as much as you can be set free from any other sin habit pattern, right? Amen. Now, I know that's not a popular message, and I know it personally because I dealt with same-sex attractions and gender dysphoria, and I didn't feel free. I prayed to receive Jesus. It didn't change. And now what's going on in our culture that wasn't going on 20 years ago, 25 years ago, when I was kind of grappling with all this stuff myself, wondering if I was born that way, is there are, are Christians now, there are churches now that are compromising the word of God, and now they're taking their experience and allow, changing their theology to match their experience. And they're saying, but I still experience same-sex attractions, or I still experience wanting to be the opposite gender, so this can't be true. I'm telling you, my friends, we cannot change our theology to match our experience. We have to allow the Word of God to be the highest authority, and it informs our experience. So the reality is, if I'm dealing, whatever sin I'm dealing with, if I have those desires, let's say it's pornography, very popular one these days that not a whole lot of people are going to admit, but it's, it's rampant, even in our churches. You know, the latest statistic says... Um, 68% of the, the uh, men in your church are going to be dealing with it, um, and that 50 to 55% of pastors deal with pornography. But nobody's talking about this. 30 to 35% of women are dealing with it. It's huge. And I get it. I was hooked on stuff. But the reality is, even though you may have desires to do those things, your desires are not supposed to be what defines you. That's what the Bible calls the old man. I'm commanded to put off the old man, not embrace it and label myself by it, and change my theology to match my experience. Just because I may have committed adultery and now I'm still tempted, the, the question is not, oh no, I'm still tempted, that means I'm still an adulterer. No, the question is, why are you still tempted? 
What's going on in your heart, the root issue that's driving you to find a shortcut rather than following God's plan that he has for you? If there's, there's, there's root issues, and it's not just rules, do this and don't do that. We've got to get to the heart issues, the root issues. And that's sometimes where we miss it, especially on homosexuality with the church, is we disregard the fact that there are root issues to all of this. And it's not a matter of do this and don't do that. But people are changing their theology to match their experience. So now people are going around and they're saying things like, you know what? I'm a gay Christian. I'm sorry, but that's 100% incongruent with the gospel. Because nobody else will go around, take this passage and say, you know what? I'm an adulterous Christian. I'm a lying Christian. I'm a greedy Christian. I'm a gluttonous Christian. I'm a porn addicted Christian. What are you? We don't change our theology to match our experience. Temptation happens, yes. Temptation is not a sin. If it were, we're in trouble because Jesus was tempted in every way such as we are, yet was without sin. It's not about whether or not you're tempted in a certain area. It's what do you do with that temptation? Are you willing to yield it to the Lord and say, God, you come in, you show me the roots to this stuff, and I just give you full permission to work in my life no matter how long and what the process looks like. You are Lord and your word stands true as the highest authority in the universe, not me and my emotions, right? Okay, so really what all this is boiling down to is the age-old question, and this is what's going on in the, the church universal right now, is there's doubt being cast on the word of God. And it's the age-old question that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Did God really say? Did he really say that? Yeah, he did. And you can try to twist the scriptures to justify homosexuality because you deal with those temptations, but it's not going to change the word of God. So instead of saying, I got to change the word of God, we need to start saying, wait a minute, this is the highest authority in the universe. How do you want to change me? How can I conform my experience to what your word says? How can your word inform my experience? Now, there's more on the whole scripture things, uh, as I mentioned before, on my website. We have a slide on that, lindasiler.com. If you just go to the resource uh, thing, you can clip it and click and find my master's thesis, and there's much more on all those scriptures. I just give you a little summary there. Okay, second question this morning is, what does science say? Are people born gay? Now, you would think by watching our, our media and, and sitcoms and hearing the news and stuff, and even last summer with the Supreme Court ruling going down, it, it's just assumed people are born this way and they cannot change. So it's a civil rights issue just as much as being black. Okay, I want to let you know it's not a civil rights issue, it's a moral issue. As soon as you put it in the civil rights realm, Christians' hands are tied because now if you oppose homosexuality, you are the KKK. That's essentially where we're at right now. But I want to let you know something. There are many, many, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds ex-gays. But you will never find an ex-African American. You know what I'm saying? You won't. Don't take this the wrong way. Michael Jackson tried. But that's not it, right? You cannot change that, okay? It's not a civil rights issue. It's a moral issue. Now, I'm not saying that we should disrespect and denigrate people that embrace a gay identity. Absolutely not. But this has been, it's, it's the scheme of the enemy to blow this thing into something that it's not. And trust me, this is not ending with gay marriage being legalized. You have now seen in the last 12 months, you know, since all that stuff escalated with the Supreme Court ruling, now it's beyond gay marriage and it's pushing the transgender thing. It's going to go beyond this. It's going to keep going until the church rises and stands and figures out what her place is to take her stand against these things and say, hey, no more. That's, that's where we need to be. It, it, by demonstrating in, in a compassionate way, right? Not in a legalistic, dogmatic, religious way. In a compassionate, informed, understanding way. But rising up and saying, uh-uh, that's, that's not what's going on here. We need to expose the lies that are out there, right? So... This whole thing is moving in a direction where the enemy wants to destroy the very concept of gender. Because your gender is male and female, image is God, as we mentioned before, unity in diversity. So what does science really say? Well, this became very personal to me, my senior year in college, as I'm wrestling with these issues and wondering, am I ever going to get free from it? Is this even possible? Should I play the Christian game where I put you know, the smiley face on and I'm doing okay, but behind closed doors I'm living a double life? I can't do this anymore. My senior year in college, I took an elective 
a human sexuality class because I needed some answers. I just want to let you know that's probably not the best place to turn for answers. It's much better to turn to the Word. But anyway, I'm in this class, and I decided to do my research on a paper on homosexuality. It just so happens, in the sovereignty of God, that in the 1990s, when I'm doing this research, all of these experiments had just come out proving there's a gay gene. So the first experiment that I read about was Simon LeVay in 1991. He did this hypothalamus study, studying the brains of gay men versus straight men. And he came to the conclusion, a gay man's brain is very much like a woman's brain. His hypothalamus is smaller. And so we, we have found something like a biological determinant that will show us who's going to end up being gay and who won't be gay. So Newsweek takes off with this, posts on the front of their magazine, you know, will this child be gay? And the, the media just took this off. We have a picture of that, yeah. Well, is this child going to be gay? And it's like all of the media in the 90s was like, yep, yep, we have definitive sci scientific proof people are born this way, and we're going to even know from a young age whether or not people have this. Another study that came out in 1993, Dean Amer uh, posted a study where he studied the XQ28 part of the chromosome, X chromosome, that's passed on in your maternal line uh, to explain how homosexuality is perpetuated even though if evolution is true, uh, homosexuals would eventually die out. If it's survival of the fittest, they wouldn't mate. And so eventually homosexuality should completely die out. So Dean Amer is like, here's why it didn't die out. Because it's passed on through the X chromosome through your mother, and everybody has an X chromosome. Men are XY, women are XX. And so we, we isolated this part of the X chromosome, and it, we can show why when people have this part this way, they're going to end up being gay. Now, the best study that you could do on proving whether there's a biological tie, a genetic tie to homosexuality, would be an identical twin study. So let's say, and don't steal my thunder here, don't click yet. Um, let's say that I had a twin, and she's an identical twin. So if she were identical to me, she would be four foot 11 and three quarters inches on a good day when she stands up straight and she has her shoes on and the wind's blowing just the right way. She would have brown hair, she would not have blonde hair. She would have green eyes, she wouldn't have brown eyes. She would look just like me. Because what do we know about the DNA of identical twins? It is identical. So if homosexuality is 100% genetic, when one twin is gay, what percentage of the time should the other twin be gay? One, you guys are fast, 100%. Okay, so this study was done in 1999, Billard and, uh, Bailey and Pillard, and they took a bunch of twins and studied them, and this was the conclusion they came to. 52% of the time, when one twin is gay, the other twin is also gay. Now, that's a far cry from 100%, but it's still a very significant portion. It's more than half, and so scientists were saying there must be something biological tied to this, something very significant uh, in our genetics that influence our, influences our sexuality. So it's like case closed, here are these things, but about... All three of those experiments that I just told you about, in order for a scientific uh, experiment to become an official scientific theory, which is what we know is a fact, what has to be true of that experiment? It has to be, it has to be replicated. Somebody has to take the same control, the same variables, and get the same result every single time, every single time, every single time. That has never happened with any three of these studies. It, despite people trying in the last 20 plus years, it has never happened. In fact, what we discovered is that the authors uh, or the scientists behind these studies had biases that were playing into their study. So the first one with Simon LeVay, we discovered that Simon LeVay was actually a gay man and he had a little bit of an agenda. And he said, I, I, he is quoted as saying, I want to educate religious people specifically about homosexuality. His partner had passed away, and, and he was doing an experiment, you know, out of that grieving thing and, and, like, wanting to really prove that homosexuality is genetic. He ends up recanting and says this, it's important to stress what I didn't find. I did not prove that homosexuality is genetic or find a genetic cause for being gay. Now, that did not make the front cover of Newsweek. Our, bias, our media is a little bit biased. It's called the influence of the enemy. Okay, Dean Amer, guess what we also found about Dean Amer? He's also gay. And so he is quoted, he recanted, his, his experiment did not uh, stand up under scrutiny. And he says, there's, there's not a single gene that makes people gay. I don't think we'll ever be able to predict 
who will be gay. Now with the twin study, what we discovered on the twin study is that in order to get their subjects for the study, they advertised among gay magazines. And so the likelihood that you will find one twin, you know, twins that are both gay when you advertise among gay people kind of increases. It's not an objective pool, right? And so that study was, uh, just came under scrutiny, scrutiny and did not stand. Additional studies have been done since 91 on identical twins because that really is the best way to show if something is genetic. And so there have been numbers of studies done. The largest and, and most diverse study that I'm aware of, and the most recent one, is 2008. You can see on the next slide, uh, by Langstrom, Raman, Carl, Carl Stroh, <laughs> Lichtenstein, et al., uh, in 2008. And in that study, they found that there is a less than 10% correlation. That when one twin is gay, less than 10% of the time the other twin is gay. What science is starting to show is that every time they do an identical twin study, the number is going down, 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 down. And so now what science is showing, even with this new thing called epigenetics, which is a, basically what it means is there are certain genes that are turned on in certain environments and it's suppressed in other environments. And people are trying to say this, is, this could explain homosexuality. Everybody, all the scientists right now are saying, hmm, it looks like things are pointing towards environmental factors that contribute to same-sex attractions. We, we can't find anything definitive that says it's 100% genetic and hardwired into who you are. So environment plays a major role here. So what are some of those environmental factors that could contribute to same-sex attractions? Now, notice I'm choosing my, my wording very carefully here. I am not saying there are environmental factors that cause homosexuality. You can't say that for any sin. What causes alcoholism? Well, we have a genetic you know, predisposition to that. I know people that don't have a pre genetic predisposition and they end up alcoholics, right? Why do people end up getting into adultery or gluttony or shopaholics or you know, needing the affirmation and praise of other people because they're insecure? There are a variety of reasons why we turn towards different sins. So you can't necessarily say there's a cause and effect. What we can say is that every sin habit that we turn to is a shortcut to the relational needs God wants to meet, just directly, him and us. But we turn to other things and other people to meet something because we don't believe God is good. We don't really believe he can meet that need in valid ways. So what are some of those environmental factors that can contribute to same-sex attractions? Okay, the first one that we look at is some kind of a disruption in the relationship with the same-sex parent. Now, this doesn't have to be very super dramatic, like the same-sex parent died, or there was divorce, or there was abuse in the family. It can be something like that. It can be an environment where a son grows up with a, an, a, an alcoholic father, and the father comes home, and you just never know if the dad's going to be in a good mood or not. And the son never develops emotional closeness to his dad, because you don't know if you can be close to him or not. It's Russian roulette as far as what mood he's going to be in. A daughter can grow up in the same situation, and if she sees uh, her dad, who might be an alcoholic or just have a bad temper, and he beats up her mom, her mom represents woman to her. And so she comes to the conclusion, it's not safe to be a woman. Why would I ever want to identify with woman, woman and be a, wom a woman when that's my destiny? And so she can make a decision as a very small child, it's not safe to be a woman. It just is the same as a little boy could grow up with this raging father and say, that's not safe, and I don't want to be like him at all. I hate that. I despise that. I'm going to withdraw from that. It doesn't have to be something really dramatic like that, though. It could be something very subtle. Like a son grows up in a family with a dad who's like, you know, like typical American masculinity. You know, he's a football player. He's a lumberjack. He works on cars. He's just like Mr. Athletic, everything we would think as masculine. And that son grows up and he has a sensitive temperament. He's in touch with his emotions. He would rather cook than go outside and play baseball with dad. And dad, even though dad's a good dad, he feels like, I just can't connect with this son. He is like this other being. He's so different. What, I, he's like a girl. Like, what do I do? And yet God designed that son to have that sensitive temperament. And this is where we get it wrong in the church. We actually perpetuate gender stereotypes from our culture. And we're really good at it in the church. And we say men need to be this way and women need to be this way. Well, what happens when you don't fit that stereotype? And especially in the church, we don't make room for that. 
But that son who grows up with that sensitive temperament, he may be artistic and musical and in the theater and whatever. God gifted him that way. And we need to affirm him in that way and say, you are fully man and fully masculine. He is masculine by virtue of the fact that he is male, not by virtue of the fact that he fits a stereotype. That's a cultural construct. Likewise, a girl that grows up and she has a mom that's, you know, everything typical female, and she's like, I want nothing to do with that. Like, I'm sporty. I like leadership. I like, you know, whatever. Then she just doesn't connect emotionally with her mom. Or more, maybe her mom is just shut down. Sometimes moms get terminal illnesses and they're not there for their kids. Or she's more into her hobbies or her other boyfriend than she is there for her daughter. And for some reason, her heart just doesn't connect. And that daughter feels like mom is never emotionally present to me. She's cold and distant, not nurturing like a mom should be. And her heart ends up hurting. There's an emotional deficit that happens. So there's a variety of ways that this disruption can happen. And believe me, the enemy will see to it that he will try to disrupt it as, any way he can. That's why he's against families. He wants to tear families apart because he knows it will perpetuate this kind of brokenness in our culture. And, so, and this is another reason why we, gay marriage is like the worst thing that could happen because we are designed by God to have a mom and have a dad. I have to have the same sex parent that will identify with me and call me into the world of woman. If I don't have that and I have two dads, there's no woman there to call me into that world and I don't fully develop in my sexuality, vice versa for boys. And so there's this thing that goes on emotionally in kids and, and if you have that emotional deficit when you're young, it's traumatic. If you don't connect the way God designed you to connect with your same sex parent, it's traumatic. Even if it's not like, it could just be that little personality thing. You just don't quite click emotionally. It's, it's not major like death or divorce or abuse, but it's still traumatic to the child's soul. And because we are body, soul, and spirit, you cannot divide your sexual development from your psyche. So when you have an emotional deficit when you're young and you're thirsting and you're crying for a mommy's love, when you grow up and you become a sexual being, that, sec that emotional deficit becomes sexualized towards other women. It is really nothing more than, I really wish my mom would have been there, but she wasn't, so I'm going to try and complete myself by finding this female to complete me. I see something whole about her sexuality and something about that nurture, something about her that I want that I never got from mom. But you don't think about it that way. That, that was not the thought that went through my mind when I was attracted to women and sleeping with other women. That's just not what went through my mind. I thought it was purely sexual and had nothing to do with anything else. And likewise, the little boy that grows up and he's, he's attracted to other men, really, it's a cry. Many times, it is a cry for the dad I never connected with. And that emotional deficit becomes sexualized and aimed at other men. We know that sex is the drive toward bonding. And so homosexuality is simply a misuse when there's emotional trauma, a misuse of our sexuality to try to bond with somebody that we see as whole and complete because I hope that they will complete me. But that's not God's use for sexuality, his design for sexuality. But, so in those ways, a breakdown with the same-sex parent can affect us. A second one that can happen, not all the time, but it can happen, is uh, sexual molestation or abuse can play a role. That's not necessarily true of everyone, uh, but there are many cases where there has been a boy, and the enemy kicks us while we're down. So let's say you've got a boy who is emotional and sensitive, in touch with his emotions, uh, doesn't, never feels like a man among men, which is traumatic in and of itself. And then the enemy picks on him by sending a male perpetrator along his way. And then the male perpetrator picks on him, gives him attention that he's longing for, he's thirsting for male attention. He finally gets it, albeit inappropriately. And then he starts asking questions. Why did he choose me? What's wrong with me that he chose me and not these other football players? There must be something wrong with me that he picked on me. And you know what? My body responded to that experience. That must mean that I'm gay. That's traumatic. And I don't care how young you are, you don't even have to be a sexual being yet, but when you experience that kind of trauma when you're young, you are body, soul, and spirit. And that trauma in your heart, as you begin and become a sexual being, that translates into your sexual de desires and drives. Because there's a wound there that Jesus wants to come in and heal. But when it's not healed, we try to find shortcuts to heal it ourselves. That's all homosexuality is. With a woman, little girls can be abused as well. When a little girl is abused, again, usually the perpetrator is a male. And it's a painful experience to her. And she concludes from that experience, I don't ever want to be vulnerable with a male ever again. Men are not safe. She's a young girl. She's not even a sexual being yet. But I guarantee you, when she grows up and she becomes a sexualized being, the enemy is going to prey on that 
And that can contribute to same-sex attractions. Not every time. I have friends that were sexually molested. It did not affect their sexuality towards homosexuality at all. Some of them turn to promiscuity with boys. Some of them, it affects eating disorders and other stuff. But for some, it will affect them with their sexuality. And they will just declare, men are not safe. Why would I ever want to be emotionally close to a man? And so they just conclude that, and it affects their sexual development. Now, there's a number of other things environmentally that can contribute to that. You can read more about that um, online. I'm not going to go into all of those today. But basically, what happens is that there are um, environmental factors that can feed into our sexual development. And I do want to say that if you're a parent here today and you're dealing with a child that is going through gender dysphoria, homosexual desires, whatever, sometimes as a parent, you can beat yourself up. And of course, the enemy wants to play into that and beat you up. And I want to let you know, no condemnation. You, you cannot be responsible for your child's reactions and, and decisions. And you, you cannot affect your child's perception of reality. Sometimes your perception of reality is you had every intention of doing the best you could. My parents, they did the best they could to raise me. And I know it. To their best ability, they tried everything they knew to do. And they were grieved when they found out what I was struggling with. I didn't tell them until I was 21. But they were grieved when they found out what I was struggling with. And yet, to their best ability, they tried to give me the best home and upbringing, and the enemy still got involved, and he misconstrued stuff. And my perception of reality was different than what reality actually was. So don't, con don't condemn yourself. The enemy wants to condemn you if you're a parent. Do owe up. Are, are there areas where I may have contributed? Okay, let's owe up to that, and let's repent from it. But don't walk in condemnation, because there's more to the story than just you and what happened. But the end result of all these things is that early childhood experiences can create an emotional deficit that eventually becomes sexualized, and so you can actually grow up believing and feeling that you are gay. I, if people would have asked me from birth, were you gay from birth, transgender from birth? Absolutely. I never had any desire to be a woman. I didn't even know what it was like to be attracted to a man. All that stuff snuck up on me, and I, yes, I feel like I'm born this way. So here I am in college, dealing with these things, grappling with this stuff, and I'm wondering, is change even possible? Fortunately, I had never told anybody, I'm living a double life, my senior year in college, and I go to a conference and I hear a speaker say, if you want to get set free from habitual, repetitive, you know, sin in your life, which I was all into sexual addictions and all that stuff, I was living a total double life, and she said, if you want to be free, the Bible says, confess your sins one to another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. And there was this conviction that came upon me. Linda, if you ever want to get free from this stuff, you're going to have to tell someone. You're going to have to bring this out in the light. With, and, and they were suggesting, tell your campus pastor, because I was at a, a, a campus crusade conference. And I just knew I got to tell my campus pastor. So I asked my campus pastor, could we get together? I got to talk to you. And he says, uh, sure, but I'm busy at the conference. Can, we can meet the day after tomorrow. In between the, those two days, I didn't know what spiritual warfare was, but I nearly killed myself, nearly jumped from the top floor of the Westin Hotel in downtown Indianapolis because I, I was just afraid that anybody would find out who I really was. So I'm, by long story short, my life was spared, and I, I ended up meeting with my campus pastor, and when I shared with him my deepest, darkest secret, you understand, I was living such a double life, they were recruiting me to come on staff with Campus Crusade. They had no idea what was going on behind closed doors. And uh, I, I just was bracing myself for that condemnation. He's going to embarrass me, uh, expel me from the group, and, like, get out of my face. We never want to see you again. You've deceived us. And he looked at me after I shared my deepest, darkest secret that I'd never told anyone in 21 years. And he said, Linda, I want to thank you for sharing that information with me. I know that that must have been very hard, must have taken a lot of courage. And I want you to know that this doesn't change our opinion of you. We love you and we want to get you the help that you need. And I walked away from that experience going, God, what was that? And you know what the Holy Spirit said? He said, Linda, that's how I feel about you. I love you, and I want to get you. I'm sad that you're hurting, and I want to get you the help that you need. I want you to know I, that was not my concept of God. I have struggled all my life with having a right concept of God, really seeing God as loving and believing he really loves me. Most people who deal with sexual issues like this have a very hard time believing God actually loves them because they've been so hurt by authority figures and there's been uh, misperceptions with their parents. And, and God intends to show his love to us through our parents. And if we don't receive it that way in the right way or we don't perceive it in the right way, it becomes very difficult to really receive it from God directly. 
So that's been a battle my whole life, and a lot of people that deal with these issues struggle with that. But that was my first glimpse into what God is really like and how he really loves me. And that day, that was December 1994, that was the first step in what was to be an 11-year journey of transformation in my life. Now, I didn't know it would be 11 years or I would have never signed up for the trip, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> never. But now I look back on it and go, oh, God, I am so grateful. I am so thankful. And I know this is not a popular message. If you're in this room right now and you struggle with these things, you're like, 11 years, forget it, man. Because we're in a culture where we like microwave Christianity. Like, let's all have an altar call here at the end and we'll, you know, pray for you. I'll lay hands on you. You'll fall out in the spirit, gay, and you'll stand up and you'll be straight. <laughs> right? that, that's what I wanted to go down, you know? And that's just so not the way it happened. But you know what? This is true for any area of our lives where we struggle. There's no such thing as swipping, sw switching a, flipping a switch and you're instantly set free from gluttony or adultery or idolatry or whatever it is. It's a process where God wants to get to our heart and heal those deep areas of woundedness and pain. So it was 11 years in my, my journey, but along the way, and things did not change instantly. In fact, God started to change the outside before the inside was absolutely transformed. And so here's a picture of me in 2001 as this androgynous woman who, I was a believer, I was seeking God for healing, but I was just still struggling with my own sexuality. I just didn't want to embrace being a woman, and I was still attracted to men. But within that year, God put a spiritual mom in my life who loved on me, and I just, I was praying, and God just started to put a desire in me to, to be a woman, not to fool anybody this time, but to truly embrace who he's created me to be. And so over that period of time, uh, Pastor Nan took me out shopping, and she's like, let's, find, let's help you find your style. Let's help you get some clothes that are, you know, what do you feel comfortable? What do you want? And I decided, I want to grow my hair out. And there were things about Pastor Nan I was really attracted to. She wore this bold, dark red lipstick. She wore rings on certain fingers. She had perfume and like just, just kind of flowy clothing. There were things that I really admired. And I realized what's going on is I'm going through like a delayed puberty where I'm admiring things in her. I'm sexually attracted to it. But really, at the root of what's going on is she's mothering me in a way I just never connected with my mom. And to the degree that I'll embrace those things I'm attracted to in her and find them, see them in myself, my attractions began to diminish, and my desires to be a woman actually grew. So she actually took me shopping. It was very thrilling, and I began to find my own style. And in a year's time, my appearance changed so drastically that I, when I went home to visit my parents, they didn't recognize me. Now, I want you to know, this was 2002. I didn't experience, like, full transformation until 2005. I was still attracted to women in this picture. I still had desires to be a man. There were still pain and issues in my heart that had not been resolved. But I was finally wanting to embrace these things for myself, not because I was trying to fool anybody, but because it's who I really am in God. So change, uh, uh, regarding change, is change possible? Well, in my life it is. Transformation happens, and my life is not the only. There are, there are hundreds and hundreds of people that have experienced this kind of transformation. A few comments about that transformation. The first one is this. Change is a journey, it's not a destination. It's a process. You can't make transformation the goal of your life. You have to make knowing Jesus the goal of your life. It's, and the change process is much like a, an onion. God was taking layer after layer after layer after layer of hurt, of pain, of woundedness in my life and showing me how he's different than I thought he was. He feels differently about me than I thought he did. And the lies I believe that it's better to be a woman than a man and all of that, he was dismantling those lies one by one. But it was a process. You can't put a timeline on transformation. Secondly, my goal was knowing Jesus, not experiencing heterosexuality. The goal is holiness, not heterosexuality. We don't make our goal like, I got to get free from this adultery, this idolatry, this gluttony, this whatever. Yes, we are pursuing freedom in those things. Like even now in my life, I, I have a tendency to turn toward food for comfort because I'm still getting that revelation of Jesus being my, my nurturer, right? And it's like, I'm not, I'm not going to go around and be like, well, I'm a gluttonous Christian and there's just nothing I can do about it. No, I'm seeking Jesus and asking him for deeper revelation to experience him as my nurturer so I don't need to turn to these other things. So my goal was not heterosexuality, but do you know what happened? As I began to embrace who I really am in Jesus, and God began to heal those deep wounds and emotional pain in my heart, my attractions began to diminish and eventually got to a point where today I am content in a female body, no desire to be a man, and instead of being attracted to women, I am 100% attracted to men. Jesus did that. 
Now, that wasn't my goal. That wasn't anything I did in my life. That was Jesus transforming me as I pursued him. I didn't know it was going to happen. Like, I, I was so happy when the same-sex attractions just diminished and they weren't even an issue in 2005. I was like, oh, this is great. This is worth the price of admission. I don't care if I'm ever attracted to men. This is awesome. I was actually asexual for about a couple years in my life. I just I wasn't attracted to women, but I wasn't attracted to men. And yet I had heard stories of other men and women that have walked through this who said, just keep pursuing Jesus. Other stuff, wholeness will come in time. Just keep going after Jesus. So I just kept going after Jesus. And you know what? Round about 2008, I'm at a prayer meeting at Purdue, directing Chi Alpha. And there's this grad student leading the meeting. And I'm just looking at him like, man, he is, I love his heart for Jesus. He is so radical. He's this, he's that, he's whatever. And he's hot. <laughs> oh, we're praying, we're praying. <laughs> it's just out of nowhere, this comes, right? So it was like this awkward, like delayed onset puberty that was like thrilling and awkward all at the same time in 2008. So I went through my own boy crazy phase in my late 30s. But um, <laughs> I share that to say now I, you know, I am, full, I missed my prime dating years for obvious reasons. And so when I, traveling and speaking is to my advantage because it increases my networking. Uh, and so you've heard of eHarmony. I need you to be my AG Harmony. If you, if you know any men radical for Jesus and in their 40s, I am available and my email's on my website. So, all right. So our goal is not heterosexuality, it's knowing Jesus. And we've got to have this attitude regarding homosexuality like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had. Nebuchadnezzar said, you need to bow down to my idol and worship it. And they said, you know what, we're not going to bow down. God's going to deliver us, and even if he doesn't, we're still not bowing down to your stinking idol. That's got to be our attitude regarding homosexuality, and especially if you struggle with same-sex attractions or gender dysphoria. That's what the Holy Spirit put in me was a tenacity of, God, I know you're going to set me free. I don't know how. I don't know when. I don't know how long. This is taking forever. But I'm not bowing down to the idol that says I need to change my theology to match my experience, and now I'm a gay Christian or a trans Christian. That's not the good news of the gospel. You can do this. But my goal was pursuing Jesus, it wasn't pursuing the transformation itself. That can become an idol in and of itself. Okay, the third thing is, it's not a sexual issue. At its root, same-sex attractions are emotional issues, as I already explained before. If you have bad fruit in your life, so here's a picture of bad fruit. That's one bad apple. <laughs> bad fruit means somewhere we can lop off the fruit and we'll never get to the problem what do we have to eventually go to the root there are roots to same-sex attractions it's not god's design for us you weren't born that way it's not genetic it's not god's hope and, and, and dream for your life there are reasons why you're struggling with that and so as a church we need to be prepared and equipped how do we help people get to the root issues and find resolve to that emotional pain that's there and then lastly, transformation is a process, a twofold process that involves relationships and inner healing prayer. You know, they say it takes a village. Well, it took a small metropolis to set me free. It took the body of Christ. It took multiple counselors, pastors, peers, my own parents. It took the body of Christ coming around me and saying, Linda, we believe in you. You are a woman among women. And we affirm you for who you are. We love you. Even when I, you know, started the healing process and then I fell and I was in bed with another woman, my pastor did not disown me. He said, you know what? We're going to pick up right where we left off and we're going to keep pursuing Jesus, right? We, we have to be patient with people and realize it's a process. You get hurt in relationships, so you're going to get healed in relationship. That's how it happens. And then secondly, there's emotional healing prayer that needs to take place for these wounds. Emotional healing prayer is nothing more than resolving bitterness and unforgiveness in our heart. Ephesians 4 says, in your anger, don't sin, and don't let the sun go down while you're still angry, and don't give the devil a foothold. We give the devil a foothold when we've been hurt, we've been violated, we've been neglected, we've been whatever. Even if you don't connect emotionally with the same parent, it's just a subtle thing, but your heart just never feels like it got connected with. That's traumatic to a child, even though it may not be like, you know, dramatic abuse or something and there's a deep emotional pain and wounds there that jesus wants to come in and heal now is there a demon of homosexuality no and so some people will say oh we're going to call everybody to the altar and if you deal with this we're going to cast a demon out of you and you're going to walk away and you're going to be free people tried that with me and you know what happened I had this amazing experience where my body contorted and all sorts of demonic manifestations happened and i got better for like a week and then after that, I ended up in like seven times more sin than before. Sound familiar? 
Why? Because we didn't get to the root issue where I opened up a door to the enemy to be there. We didn't address the foothold. And so we had to go, where did she open up the door and give legal ground to the enemy? When we find that legal ground and I forgive those that hurt me and I, and I bless them, then we're able to tell the enemy, hey, you got to go away. You lost your legal ground. And he did. Now, there were demons involved. There, deliverance is a real thing. Don't get me wrong. Uh, but it's just not simple like we're going to cast one demon out of you and you're done. I had multiple demonic influences in my life, and we had to deal with those. But we couldn't deal with those without going to the foothold where I had given legal ground to that. Okay, so lastly this morning, what, shall be our, what should be our response as, as God's people? The first thing is this. We must have compassion on those that struggle with same-sex attractions. Whether they are people within the church who are like, man, these are unwanted same-sex attractions and I want to get free, but also people outside the church who are gay identified and they're like, I have no desire to be free from that. This is who I am and you need to love me for who I am. You know what? We need to have compassion rather than just getting militant and, and mad at people and being legalistic in our own righteousness. Homosexuality is not the unpardonable sin. Now, the Bible does call it an abomination in Leviticus 18 and 20. But do you know what? The Bible also calls lying an abomination. So if you have ever stretched the truth or made yourself look better than other people think you should, or you've made a promise to God and you didn't fulfill it, you have committed an abomination. What's an abomination? It's something God hates. It's something God detests. Why does he hate it? Because it's incongruent with his character and nature. Why does God hate lying? Because he's the God of truth and he will never deceive you. Why does he hate homosexuality? Notice, not the homosexual, not the person who practices homosexuality. He hates the act, the homosexual act. Why? Because it's incongruent with his character and his nature. Because we are to be unity and diversity, and that does not image God. Okay? So we have to have compassion for those who embrace a gay identity or experience same-sex attractions because we understand the big picture of why these things develop. And, but for the grace of God, you would have developed those same-sex attractions because of brokenness in your life, too. It's simply a form of brokenness in our fallen world. Secondly, we cannot condone homosexual practice. Even though we're compassionate towards those people, we can't condone it. That's not unloving to say we can't condone homosexuality, even though it may get to the point where your church loses a 501c3 status because you don't condone homosexuality, homosexual practice in your leadership. We're facing that on the college campus. But we have to toe the line on the word of God and be like, hey, Nebuchadnezzar, we're not bowing down to your stinking idol. God's going to deliver us, and even if he doesn't, we're not bowing down to your idol. Take our 501c3. We're going to keep worshiping Jesus, right? Now, our culture would say, that's hateful. No, it's not hateful. Let me give you some advice. When somebody accuses you of hating them because you disagree about homosexuality, just put it this way. I love you. You're my friend. I disagree on the morality of this issue. Make it about the issue, not the person. I disagree with what you believe on this issue, but I love you. You're my friend. Affirmation sandwich. I love you. I disagree. I love you. Separate the person from the, uh, the issue. It is not unloving to disagree on an issue. We all in here disagree. If I said, you know, how many in here like chocolate? Oh, yeah. How many of you like vanilla? Yeah, it's always the minority because we all know chocolate's superior. But we can disagree... <laughs> We can agree to disagree agreeably, and those of you who like vanilla, I like chocolate. I know that's a mundane example compared to the heated topic of homosexuality, but the truth is we can disagree on things and still love another human being when we disagree. So it's not unloving for us to say we can't condone homosexual practice. In fact, homosexual desires are actually, as I mentioned before, a warning sign that deep emotional pain is going on there. So it actually would be most unloving for me to reinforce someone else's brokenness and rob them of the freedom their heart is actually longing for. That would be most unloving on our part. So we, uh, really what homosexuality is, is what Romans 1 says, where we exchange the truth about God for a lie and worship created things rather than our creator. In, in homosexual desires, I'm looking for a human being, a created person to fill my heart and to heal me in a way that only God can. So it's not unloving to say we can't condone homosexual practice. Um, I'm told that your youth group is showing the, the movie Such Were Some of You. This is a documentary that talks about there are 29 different men and women in this documentary who have been set free from homosexuality. They have stories very similar to mine. It is, this has won all sorts of Dove Awards and, 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 and things like that in the, the Christian world. 
Uh, it, is, it is excellent. I highly recommend it. You can go to suchwerethsomeofyou.org and get a copy of your own. Uh, I brought a leadership copy to give the pastor today, so you guys have another one here at the church to show. Uh, but it is so well done. I highly recommend it, and it's one of the best ways to get the good news out there that transformation is possible. I also mentioned that on my website, I have a number of other resources available. If you want to look at um, books, articles, videos, there's a trailer to the movie, such were some of you on there. I designed my website to be a launch pad for those who are like, I need answers. I don't even know where to begin. You can begin there, and it will link you to other resources and websites. It will link you to ministries that know how to walk people through inner healing. One of them is called Elijah House. And when I was praying for your church, I felt like the Lord told me specifically, he's never told me this before with another church I was praying for, but he told me, uh, pray that there will be a catalyst at Richmond Lighthouse, one or two people that would be willing to go out to Elijah House, it's in uh, Washington State, and, and get training in this area so that they can come back to Richmond and train other people so that you guys really would be a lighthouse in this area to set people free. Yeah. So there's a, there's a link... There's a link to Elijah House on my website. It's elijahhouse.org. But if you sense, God, you have a heart for this and you want to help captives get set free, I highly encourage you to go to that link. And the last thing, the way we need to respond is we cannot force someone else to want transformation. Whether they're in the church or outside the church, you are going to meet people that are, they, they say they follow Jesus and they have these attractions and they don't want to part with them. We still need to love them. You can't cram transformation down their throat. You can't accuse them, well, you're going to hell and God doesn't love you. You know what? I don't know what the state of their soul is. But we got to love people and not, we don't need to make homosexuality the hot button topic. Even with people at work, you're going to have coworkers and neighbors and people in this world that are gay identified and they have no intention of, of changing. They don't believe transformation is possible and they don't want to hear it. And we are called to still love them and not force transformation down their throat. Don't, don't go get the such were some of you video and sit down with your coworker who's a militant gay, you know, and, and like show them the video. Like that's just not love, okay? There, there's, it's, there's a way that we can be as wise as serpents and as innocent as doves. And we can love people into the church. What we need to do is learn how to pray radically for people in private and love radically in public. Because only the Holy Spirit can bring conviction to people's hearts. You can't be Holy Spirit Junior and do that. Only the Holy Spirit can do that. And so we've got to have wisdom about how we're approaching this issue in our culture. No, we can't compromise, but don't make it the pet issue. Don't make it, well, you have to give up being gay in order to find Jesus. No, you don't. You, if you get the Holy Spirit in them, I guarantee you, he'll start dealing with them about their sexuality, okay? We don't do that with any other sin, drunkenness or fornication or whatever. We just try to connect people with Christ, Make Jesus and the gospel the main issue. Don't make sexual issues like this, this hill we're going to die on. We're not, hear me well, I'm not saying compromise on the truth. You get what I'm saying, right? It's the gospel. So we can't force somebody to become a Christian. We can't force somebody uh, to give up, you know, if, if they don't want to give up their gay identity. You can't force that on somebody. But what we can do is love them right where they're at, the same way Christ has loved you and me when we weren't what we needed to be, what he was calling us to. And he was patient with us, wasn't he? So I'm going to end there. I asked Pastor if he would uh, lead you guys in the altar time because he knows you better than I do.